So happy new year and welcome to our first 2023 Physics Matter Colloquium series. So for more celebration on basic science and sustainable development. So this month, so we are returning to the in-situ origin of the special source of light in the Middle East, the Sesame, with Professor Elise Rabinovici. So it's a great honor to have him today with us, live from Jerusalem. So we recall our special forum last July dedicated to celebrate the origin of Sesame with Professor Herman Winnick for his 32.2 degrees Celsius. So we had gathered then 18 of his prestigious colleagues and friends, so including Professor Rabinovici. So we can find more of the numerous memory of that event in the paddle, so the wall of ideas, and the podcast that we had created for each individual VIP in our Physics Matter website. So, but today we will have in situ origin of the Sesame. So it's a more celebration of the power of humanities in the quest of peace and excellence. So this is the mission of our live event, which is organized by the Forum of International Physics, the FIP, at the American Physical Society. So sharing and opening new gates for developing community and with developing community. So together we want to create a flow of ideas which are both educational and interesting for your community. So the member of our panel, so we have uh, uh, today, so Andrea Lossi, who is the scientific director of the CESAMI with us and the Forum of International Physics. So for this, uh, the current chair line, so I'm the, um, chair, the chair for the forum. Uh, I'm working at the European Spallation Source and uh, Joni Mela from the ICTB may join us uh, a bit later on. But our special guest of honor today is Professor Elise Rabinovici. So who is an Israeli theoretical physicist, twice president of the Sesame Conseil. So he's the professor in the Rakash, sorry, Institute of Physics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He received his PhD in high energy physics at the Weizmann Institute in science in 1974. And in the following years, so he worked in a research associate uh, fellow, so at the Fermilab and at the Lawrence Berkeley Radiation Laboratories. So Professor Rabinovici has been chair of the Israeli committee, so since uh, 97, and uh, he has been chair also of the Israeli High Energy Commission committee, sorry, so from 2004 to 2020. And in 2004, so he was appointed as one of the Israel delegate at the CERN Conseil, where he has served as vice president, so from 2016 to 2018, and he's now the current president of the CERN Conseil. So this is a great honor to have him today. So we will uh, give him then the screen, and then we will keep the question for the end. So you have a uh, um, so question and answer at the end, and you can raise your hand, and we can have you as well asking him live question. So Professor Abibichi, then if you want to uh, start sharing. Okay, yeah. is it seen? Yes, very well. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be in this forum and I want to say Christine uh, and the APS for organizing this. So I'm going uh, to be personal. So this is going to be a very personal description. I have to say that I, I always quote that uh, successes have many fathers and uh, somehow failures are orphans. So I would like uh, you to remember that here, I think up to now the project is a success. So it has many fathers and I'm describing my personal point of view. Now, in general, why is this talk different from me than the other talks I give? Well, the main point is it is not based on the irrefutable logic of all the physics talks I give. Actually, it comes from inside, uh, from the thing which is common to all of us, our common protons, electrons, and neutrons. It is a talk about the parallel universe, which is a universe which in my field of string theory is something which we 
considers at least the level of a thought. And the main thing is, I am here actually as a voice of other people. There are many people involved in this project. These people are spread all over the planet. Most of their names you never heard of, but without each of them, this project would have never come uh, to fruition. So I will try to be as faithful as I can, a voice to those uh, people. Now, recently, the war in Ukraine also put uh, us in a sesame in a different light and an extra light, which towards the end of my talk, I will touch upon. So as a voice for others, I will first uh, like to give actually the voice to, uh, to people on a BBC program well before Sesame uh, was established. Please. This is something I would like to leave to next generations. This is what I believe in. It has to work because it means a better world. It means a better world from many uh, aspects um, in terms of bringing science here, in terms of bringing uh, a line of communication, maybe it will not bring peace to the region. It is very valuable and it is very important for all region because we can, one country cannot afford uh, to have a uh, single uh, synchrotron machine. Here we are as scientists and scientists usually belong to the humanity, not to the country. I understand that there are some political use of science but we are not here for political use of science. We are here for science. The work we do here can be used in many fields, including electronics, including engineering, including material science. So it will have many applications from cement to health. What we hope is that science will open the door to uh, for uh, other or further understandings concerning other issues. Okay, this is what we hope. I mean, we will begin with science and somehow we will open the doors that are closed for years or for centuries. Iranian and Palestinians and Pakistanians, scientists are my friends because they are scientists. So we have a common ground. The common ground is doing research. We don't care about what is your religion, what is the color of your skin. We don't care about that. We only care about science. In science, there is no hostile. Okay. We are scientists, we are academic people. We, we are not dealing on political issues. I think uh, Sesame is a mm, modern technology uh, which uh, help to people around the Middle East uh, to develop and improve their knowledge. I imagine a war would bring it to a stop, but we've been pretty close to the uh, a war or very very high tension level in the last few years and somehow we've managed to keep going it was always my dream to show that arabs and israelis can work together for the benefit of humanity and for the benefit of their own people both sides having an interest in that and for me sesame in a way is an incarnation of such a dream Okay, now this wasn't, uh, people weren't reading scripts. This was all spontaneous. And the fact that this group of people coming from different countries, which some of them are in conflict, were able all to express themselves in, in such a way is of course amazing uh, on its own. Now, another uh, video I want to show you, but for this, I want to mute uh, a moment and let's see how much problems that will cause, because I just want you to see the pictures and I want you to see what evolved because when BBC took that uh, film, Sesame was not constructed. And now it is, it's a real thing, it really works. So I want to show you the difference between the two, but I want to mute the, so just a moment, I need the ability uh, to mute it.
Okay, I returned the voice and now we can go back to the, to the talk itself. So I will uh, start by uh, discussing science for understanding. The introduction will be a little bit on how to make dreams real, how to lay the foundations to do a project whose purpose is science for understanding, what type of science is the best suited for that, how one puts all the elements together, where are we today, and what are the lessons uh, we can learn about from this. And they turn out to be very relevant to the present age. So science for understanding and Let's say that we are giving now here course 101 on science for understanding. So what is a requisite to enter the course? The a requisite is an infinite amount of optimism. If you have less than an infinite amount of uh, optimism, I don't think you're really welcome to the, to the course. There's no chance you will survive it. If you read the newspapers and listen to all the analysts, if you watch TV, you read what you see on the internet, you will never embark on such a journey. So you need to be a little bit autistic to the external world. A first question is, why do we choose science when we are trying to build bridges of understanding? Why not something else? And then, one can also ask a question, which is at the end the financial question, what time scales does one expect to get a return because one puts in investments? So I will start and now address the issue of why science. Science and what scientists have in common is that the way they interact with each other removes the veils which prejudices, propaganda, general perception puts when you meet people sometimes which are your enemies. When two uh, scientists meet, they're not going to argue about the laws of quantum electrodynamics. They both agree on it. In other fields when one tries to make communication. I can give an example. I was director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Jerusalem, and we had a meeting where religious scholars from several religions had to interpret the five first books of the Old Testament. And it was 10 months long. And after about eight months, uh, the the group, the leaders of this group came to me and told me that this has been a fantastic success and they are considering to continue doing this in Zurich in Switzerland. It's such a big success. So I asked them, okay, what did you agree upon? Well, they said we succeeded to agree on five verses out of the books. So eight months it took to reach agreement on five verses, which maybe actually took generations to lead to reach that. In science, this is not the case. When you see another scientist, you can appreciate her or his science, you form an opinion. Is it a person that can teach you things? Is it a person that you will learn from? Is it a person that you can teach? And this actually scientists form these feelings very fast. Uh, of course, scientists like other human beings may like the person opposite them or not, but that's already not on, on any other basis. It's maybe the simple chemistry, but the original interaction is, is there. They are not all the veils and obstacles that we have for communication between, between members of countries or citizens of countries which are in conflict for a long, long time. So that's one thing. Now, in particular, there are branches of science where if you don't have the skill of collaboration, 
it will be very difficult for you to perform your experiments, be it in your small group, and in some cases, like CERN or SESAME, large groups. So scientists, from that point of view, also have, or several, quite a few of them, have the skills of collaboration. And the last point is that scientists are given a very special privilege by our societies. We are allowed to do every day the thing that our heart desires. We like the work we are doing it and we enjoy it. This is not the privilege of every member of this planet. And I think as a recognition of that, we need to be able wherever we can to contribute back to society and building bridges for understanding as scientists is one way to help society and to express our appreciation to society, which helps us. Okay, now what are the time scales involved? Well, the, I'm sorry, this is in Hebrew, but you can probably see that you have an instant pudding, an instant soup, an instant way to get a six pack by five minutes a day. That's the time scale, let's say, in the span of attention of politicians or the span of attentions that you see in the media. Then there is a time scale of really big projects, which take hundreds of years, and you see three of them uh, before you. When you want to do, try and build, build bridges for understanding, you have to find some intermediate time scale. Nothing is going to happen in five minutes, but if the returns of hundreds of years, it's a little too much to sustain, to be able to sustain the effort, but decades is I think the relevant uh, time scale. And in the process, one is developing the, the skills to do science diplomacy, but I want to stress, it's not that science, science diplomacy is one of the tools in a kit which foreign ministries, for example, have in order to reach and or think they can reach better understanding. I'm not sure that, the, I think if you look at these things as tools, you will have many, many disappointments. I think you have to think about it as a long-term investment in building these bridges for understanding. Okay, now what type of science and who will determine what should be done? There is one approach which is the top bottom approach. You can have the leaders of their countries. This is a random example of leaders. They have their scientific advisors or not. And then they tell by the way they speak is through the budgets, they tell the scientists what to work on. That's one way. There is other way that the scientists which are in the field, which recognize what the problems are, try to find access to the top, have to sometimes raise their voice and try to convince those above what are the correct and the right fields of knowledge that have to be explored. And this has a constant tension in the life and is different, it has different expressions in different countries. So top bottom or bottom top, one dilemma. The other dilemma, should it be small science that where you would do the collaboration or should it be big science like CERN? Okay, my opinion is I prefer bottom top and I prefer small science. But in the case at hand, I had to compromise. I hate, by the way, to compromise, but I had to compromise. And we had to do in order to gain the interests of the country. And in order to, that the countries agree to provide an umbrella for the scientists to collaborate, we needed to have a top bottom approach and we, need, we needed to have big science. So this was a compromise which was done. On what can one not compromise in my belief as we are progressing in the course? One can not compromise on the project having to be good science. I think it is better not to have a project than a project which is mediocre science. Now, of course, when a disease comes to 
countries, and unfortunately we had an example of a very serious pandemic, then you can have collaboration which is one-sided. Namely, there is one side which knows to build, to produce vaccination, and the other side gets the vaccinations. That's of course essential in these moments. But in general, in order to build understanding via collaboration, in my opinion, the collaboration should have the feature that each side is essential for the collaboration. Each side brings its own knowledge. And then together, each one has extracts their own benefits, but also succeed to produce the mutual benefits. So I, I would say that in these projects, one should not compromise on having good science. As I said, each side should be able to contribute and each side should benefit. Next step in the course is uh, forming dreams. Okay, so what are here the dreams which have been already looked at? So here is, for example, Europe after World War II. It, it was decided by both the Europeans and actually the United States played this key role in this, that it would be a good idea to heal the wounds of Europe, or at least partially heal the wounds in by bringing the scientists which were each in its own country, uh, trying to devise the most effective methods to kill the soldiers and the citizens of the other country and try and bring them together I think it was an enormous success. It was brought together at, uh, at CERN, which has become now the best uh, laboratory for high energy physics in the world. My region ha also has the same dilemma. We also need to heal, but there is a big difference between Europe after World War II and our region. In our region, the war is not over. In Europe, the war was over. It was clear who won and who lost. In our region, the narratives are different. Each side may think it's winning or losing, but there is no accepted situation who is actually winning and who is losing. And therefore the challenge to try and build bridges for science in my region, I would say are quite more significant than building them in World War II after, sorry, building them after World War II. And as I said, we are now in, in a situation where such issues come up again. So a few uh, words on CERN, because CERN embodied these type of ideas. Right now, it's the, it has a accelerator, which is 27 kilometers in circumference. It is 100 meters deep. Uh, for those who don't know, it's not deep uh, in order to protect it from being attacked or from it attacking the environment, but it's the, in the region which you see, you need to go down about 100 meters to have a, a stable geological strata, which is essential for running the machine. The machine has to be stable to a very, very high degree, about one tenth of a width of a hair. So, this is the reason it's there. And now one is even thinking of a 91.2 kilometer machine. So this is an enormous machine. Its purpose is one and is one. It's part of this ambitious goal of the human race to be able to find on one slide all the equations which describe the material world and the constituents of the material world. It, it sometimes works. These are the countries which participate. There is a very large, this is a planetary collaboration and these are the member states involved at CERN. This is Sesame on the other hand in 2015. That's a, a photo that it doesn't look much different now, the main building from outside. What is inside? At CERN, one, in order to be able to understand what are the basic constituents of matter, one behaves like children who want to understand what their toys are built out of, one smashes them. So by smashing at the highest possible energy, two protons, one learns 
as much as we can, one can about what constitutes the structure of matter and what are the laws of physics governing that. In the Middle East, we have enough collisions and that's not what we want. In the Middle East, also for other reasons, we actually want a light source. And the machine in the Middle East, which is hosted in this building, has in it electrons. When electrons are accelerating, and in particular, when they go in a circle, they're accelerated, they emit radiation. This radiation enables us to study many, many features. This is just the schematic structure. There is a source, which is a result of the radiation of light coming out of the electrons moving in a circle. By certain combination of optics, it hits a sample. There are detectors, we check it, and I will come in a moment to what type of things they actually can examine. This is a, a electro electromagnetic spectrum range where synchrotron radiation actually works. So you can see it's between radar and uh, X-ray machines and radioactive uh, elements. Now, the distribution of sources, there are many in the world. When I showed you CERN, the, the distribution was of institutes which participated at CERN. Here, I'm showing you the distribution of light sources all over the world. You see the light source, which is in the Middle East, in Jordan. That's the topic of what I'm discussing today. And you notice the big vacuum around it. You have to go all the way to Italy to really see a high quality machine of the, of the same type. So having this in the Middle East is really, as you heard from the younger generation when they were thinking of having it, it's a really a very significant achievement. What can you study there? Now at CERN, one studies, it's the, one can of course subdivide it into topics, but the basic thing is this ambitious goal what are the basic constituents of nature and what are the laws which govern their behavior? That's it. In a light source, there is a much larger rainbow of things you can check. There is physics. You can study physics in various setups. There is chemistry. There is biology. Uh, when Ada Yonat, uh, the first woman, woman in a long time, which got a Nobel Prize, uh, she studied uh, the structure of RNA and she studied that in such a light source. You can study environmental science. You can study, use it for medical purposes, for material science, for geophysics, even for heritage issues. If you want to study a papyrus and you don't want the papyrus to disintegrate when you study it, one of the possibilities is bring it to sesame and you will be able to study a papyrus which is thousands of years old. So this has this type of machine has a very, very large spectrum of possible scientific uses, which is one of the reasons which when I will describe what we chose, this is one of the reasons why we chose it there. Now the members, as you saw in the movie produced by the AAAS, are actually not the usual members. You see Turkey together with Greek part of Cyprus, you see Israel with Palestine, with Egypt, Jordan, Iran, and Pakistan. Unlike CERN, which has many members and few observers, Sesame has many, few members and many observers. So we are all blessed by the observers, but for, as a business model, financially, it's better to have more members. Now, the objectives of this light source can be formulated in this way. They foster excellence in science and technology. They reverse brain drain in the region, which actually we did not yet succeed because the training in Sesame is so good that actually we are losing people to other machines. But in principle, it offers the potential of reversing brain drain. It enhances regional science and technology and also improves the understanding among peoples 
of diverse backgrounds, which through peaceful co cooperation, even though those countries cannot characterize always their relations by being peaceful. Here are some photos from the journey. This is one photo which I asked you to look at, it was taken in 2004 by Rafik Saraf, a Palestinian constructor who built the concrete foundations of Sesame. Sesame is built in earthquake area, so it needs to have very solid foundations. Look at it a moment, at the end, uh, let's try and remember and guess what actually this is. Now here you see again a picture of people working together from different nations, building things together. And this is just to give you a little bit of the spirit. When I visited CERN, when at a certain moment CERN was using, was helping construct actually this part of the Sesame machine, you could see how the young people are excited, really excited to have the possibility to work on such a project. So how did we reach the situation? How did we come to a situation where we have a functioning, working light source in the Middle East, where there is none around us and there was none before? So you need visionaries and Abdus Salam, Nobel laureate, which uh, was also the first director of the ICTP in Trieste. He, when he was, he was actually thinking about the Muslim world and he was saying that, and he had the same motto that you should always do only quality science and not second rate science. He thought that having light sources would help skip uh, the, years or the decades in which knowledge has not progressed in those countries. And he saw the light source is a very good uh, idea for that. And what is behind it? In, in the Muslim world or now in our region, we don't have a, enough of a community to build a dedicated machine. However, if you have a light source which caters to many parts of, aspects of science, then you can build gradually a critical mass of people that can work there. So this is definitely the correct thing if you want to build bridges for understanding in a region which is not at the, at the top in this field. So you bring a very good machine there and then you can attract and scientists from these countries by attracting many, by having many fields of research uh, available uh, to them. And indeed, it took many decades to build Sesame, but one of the advantages, or let's say at least not the disadvantages of having the decades was that we had time to build a community of users all over the region. Now, Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Now it's true, beautiful dreams are rare, but they also come for free. And the real hard work, and if you came to my course, I assume that you want to work on this, is actually make, making it happen. This is where the work is. So one can have this beautiful dream that how great it would be if we would collaborate, but then one actually has to do it. Now, the, this, particular uh, project, Sesame, I think is very unique. And I'm testifying from outside. I'm a string theorist, a theoretical particle physicist. I don't use, I'm anyhow not an experimentalist, but also my theory is not the theory of light sources and I don't use light sources. So I'm, but I can testify that there are extremely high quality scientists from all over the planet, which involved and dedicated a lot of their time for Sesame. The quality we are doing the very best that it be of high quality and the amount of dedication stretching over decades, I think is also unique. Here is a list of names of Israeli scientists which were uh, involved in, in Sesame and I won't, I'm just putting it, I won't show it in great detail. Let's go back to the origins of Sesame. So I said one can have an idea, but how did it come into being? So 
In the year 19, around 1995, actually, uh, we uh, began to think that a way to bring to build a bridge of understanding between the Arab world and Israel is by trying to do it through science. As I said, we were thinking in the beginning of small science. We went to a place called Dahab, and here I plot um, a, as a function of time, the hope index. Now you see that's in red and the hope region index in my region goes up and down actually against the laws of mathematics. I would say that the, it more goes more down than up. And nevertheless, sesame in green light on this background of so very strong fluctuations in politics and hope did succeed from nothing in Dahab to become something real. One of the lessons I have, by the way, from this is that it's all personal and I will, as the Godfather said in the famous movie, and I will exemplify it in some cases. My own route to this started when my good friend and collaborator, the late Sergio Fubini, a scientist which spent time at MIT and at CERN, played a key role in CERN, became 65, uh, in at CERN, they're very strict with the uh, rules of retirement. So in 65 was actually the period of, for him to retire from CERN. And like many Italian professors, he can go for a few more years to a university in Italy and he, he chose uh, Torino to go. Now he uh, came to me in the corridors of uh, CERN he, we had many discussions with him over the years. This, by the way, is a picture of him. And he told me, uh, look, uh, I know that we discussed all your naive ideas about collaboration between Arabs and Israelis over the years. Maybe now, after the Oslo Accords, it's time to try and see if this can work. So I'm asking you, he said, to give two talks, one on your science, on string theory, which is my science. I think it was an excellent talk, if you allow me to say. And the second talk was about uh, Arab-Israeli collaborations. What can we learn about that, which can be useful for us in the future? So I did a research. Uh, I found out that when the Camp David Accords of Peace between Egypt and Israel were signed, there was an annex which allowed scientific collaboration between Egypt and Israel. And this could serve as an anchor to various type of collaborations. And my lesson was the one I already told you, that those collaborations were, that were successful were those where both sides could contribute and both sides had an interest. A particular one is marine science and studying of the Red Sea. This was a German Egyptian Israeli collaboration. And in that collaboration, the German brought a lot of their marine knowledge and equipment. Israelis brought their knowledge and technical uh, issues and the Egypt brought its centuries knowledge of marine sciences. And it was really essential that they, these three ingredients were there and this is what I reported in the meeting. Now, following the meeting, uh, Sergio Fubini and myself accompanied by uh, other people like uh, Devoto, uh, De went uh, to Egypt actually representing nobody but ourselves. And we, we did meet in Egypt people which did represent the government uh, this was, uh, in particular, we met uh, Dr. Venis Gauda, which was Minister of, Sci for, of Science for Scientific Research of the Arab Republic of Egypt. And she told us that uh, she had a meeting with her, the, her president at the time, Mubarak, and that he uh, told her that she can do collaborations uh, because he decided to take politics outside of that. So we met a group of people. As I said, Sergio represented Sergio, except we invented a committee which didn't really, had great names on it, but wasn't really a, a strong heavyweight committee from the point of view of politics. In science was very high quality. And myself, I represented, I was at the time chairman of the Raqqa Institute of Physics 
I went to the Israeli Academy of Science and asked for one blessing at least. So I'm not just a total entrepreneur and that I can get involved in, in these discussions. So here is the agreement we signed and it's very important to sign this agreement. This agreement was signed by the way on a Macintosh uh, and at that time Macintosh disappeared and the Italian uh, embassy in Cairo had a Macintosh too. And this is where we concluded our agreement. You see signed by Sergio Fubini representing this committee we made, which is the scientific committee for the Middle East. Uh, there was a uh, Dr. Muhammad Mukhater El Hawaji, which was first under Secretary of State. And then uh, there was myself as chairman of the Raqqa Institute of Physics, again, not a political entity. Here you see a, how young I was, so you can see how long has passed since we started this. You can see Sergio Fubini, and you can see on the picture Albert Einstein, which is associated with the Hebrew University. And I think he looks at us with a positive eye, with a good eye. And you see as four Egyptian uh, physicists visiting the Hebrew University. I think actually it's the first and last time that this happened, but it was a very inspiring uh, visit. And we decided on how to go on uh, uh, in the future. However, there was a small problem there uh, that uh, the Egyptians came, they didn't have a, a per diem which allowed them to live in Jerusalem. I could not use my scientific grants in order to pay their per diem. Uh, Sergio Fubini said, I will take out my checkbook and write. So I told Sergio that if we are doing an organization which we have to fund from our own pocket, my Israeli salary, which was very low at the time, uh, could not be a reliable basis for this, the future of this uh, collaboration. So we need to find friends. And that's when it, I said it became personal. From my office, we called Miguel Virasoro. Miguel Virasoro was at the time the director of the ICTP. He sent a letter to with to Fubini, who, with whom he appreciated very much, uh, with copies to uh, Denardo, uh, Devoto, and uh, myself, where he says he's going to give us money. With this money, we could begin to move. We decided then to have a meeting in the Sinai for the first time, bringing together people from all over the region. Now look at the auspices of, the, of this and look at the emblem or the, uh, how the Lego looks here. You see it's written physics in Hebrew, Arabic, English and Italian. And you see this is done under the auspices of ICTP, CERN, UNESCO, Egyptian Ministry of Science, Israeli Academy of Science, Italian Institutes, INFN, the Higher Council for Science and Technology, Jordan, the National Research Center, Cairo, National Institute, Cairo, Hebrew University, Jerusalem, Bethlehem University, Palestine, International School for Advanced Study, CISA in Italy, Trieste, University of Calgary, Napoli and Torino. Again, a cocktail which I don't think has been since seen. And actually we built a very high quality meeting and we addressed it to three strata. We brought the senior scientists, we brought the active sciences, and we brought the new generation. This was an extremely exciting uh, meeting. It started in a Bedouin tent. You, I'm sorry, the pictures of myself, because those are the ones that I, was, I had. You see Venice Gauda, the female sitting uh, there. You see Sergio Fobini, and you can see Jacob Ziv, if you, any one of you use the dot zip in your algorithms then, uh, or in your computer compression, he invented it and he is a president, was the president of the Israeli Academy at the time and he supported, as you saw, uh, this initiative. This happened under a Bedouin, under the roof or of a Bedouin tent, was very emotional. It started actually by Venice Gauda telling us all uh, to stand uh, 
in a moment of silence for Yitzhak Rabin, which was murdered by an Israeli who actually work, uh, was a student in a university in Israel. And nevertheless, 90 people from the Egypt uh, stood up as did Palestinians, Moroccans, Israelis, of course, and many others which were there. That was a very emotional moment where a minister from Egypt said that we should stand a moment of silence for somebody who was a general who fought against Egypt. So, and then he sought peace. So th this is a, a very, very special uh, a moment. There were very, people of the best scientists were there. Maybe you recognize here Edward Witten, again, quite a few years ago, Louis Alvarez Gomez and others. This made to the CERN career. You see again, Venice Gauda, you see Fubini, you see Jacob Ziv. And we signed an agreement, many, 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 uh, items, but there was one problem. War started in Lebanon, one of the fights which occurred in Lebanon and politics returned to science and we had to interrupt our initiatives, even though we had already a climate change, a high, very high standard climate change meeting supposed to be held in the Sinai, uh, focusing on the phenomena of El Nino. But okay, this didn't happen. And then we had to retreat uh, without any dignity uh, to Torino. And there we got the help of Todd uh, Ekelov, uh, who uh, built together, we built together a program on what to do after we have to retreat from the region. And the main point here is if you read this, we were thinking of particle physics and definitely we had ideas and things came out of it on a low scale. But then there was also the suggestion to have the synchrotron radiation uh, machine. And uh, this is uh, a, the beginning, if you wish, of Sesame. Uh, I must say, I don't know how it is for other people in the region. I know that for me, it's not that everybody agrees in Israel, this is a good thing to do. So in Israel, we usually live in apartment buildings. So neighbors would put in here, I don't, I don't know if you see here, because this mute and so on uh, seems to cover, but this is a, a, a paper explaining how bad the Egyptian newspapers can be towards Jews and Israel, which is true. So this was to discourage me for that. So it's not easy and I can only imagine the difficulties which my Arab colleagues or Iranian colleagues had in their own countries when this comes, when they have to explain collaboration. Now in this meeting, which we had in uh, Torino, uh, Gus Voss came and uh, described the program that he and Hermann Winnig from Slack had, and that is to take an old German machine which was about to be dismembered. This is Bessie in Berlin. And that this should actually be how we can collaborate. So this was an idea which they presented uh, then. And as I said, we, pre we were prepared for such an idea. That's why we held it. And they came with the idea of using Bessie. So now we come to constructing the foundation. Okay, I was hoping, and we had a detailed agreement with Egyptians on having small scientific uh, agreements. But that became impossible again when politics returned into the science relation. So what? why is the idea which they brought of, for a synchrotron so great? It is a great idea because you don't have just one field where you don't have a critical mass in the region for. And here you have a critical mass if you have time to lay the foundations. And we did, we laid the foundation. At that stage, Hervik Schopper, this is 2004, took over from um, Sergio Fubini. He became the, the head of MESC. He was pushing for a big project. He liked the idea of the light source. And he recruited Khaled Tukan, who was at the time, I think a president of the University of El Balka in Jordan. 
So they discussed and they said, or they proposed that we should have a German uh, take Bessie instead of throwing away its pieces that we should take them. Now I don't see the audience at all, which is a drawback. So I can't see your reaction, but I, I, if it would be now a class, I would put the exam question, should we take it or should we leave it? Now, I think if you listened well to what I expressed, there is no way you would take it. This is a machine which is going to be, is being dismembered. Yes, it has pieces of metal and so on, which are useful, but what good scientist would come and work there if she or he can have alternatives to work at what much better machines? It's, it's exactly against all the idea that you need to do good science. So the obvious decision, which I hope every student in the class wrote, leave it, don't touch it. We took it. Why did we need to take it? Well, there was this extra consideration that we need to build the administrative structure between countries or among countries, which some of them are enemies of each other. That's not an easy task to do. And it's even more difficult if you are speaking about nothing. By taking a machine, you at least have something concrete to talk about. I must say that we were actually had, had in mind the, this business model, which is not very much liked in the United States, but used a lot, which is called bait and switch. And this is what we did here. Namely, we baited everybody by the fact that we are together, but then we said, we can't work with such a machine. A, an old machine is useless to us. But first of all, we need to be able to establish the administrative infrastructure. So we met in UNESCO in Paris and we began to discuss where to do it. There were many, many suggestions and we had to decide where, to, how to do it was in a way easy. We did cut and paste for what CERN did. This presented one problem, which I may touch on later, but otherwise was a very smooth way to do it. Uh, the problem I can touch upon it now is that CERN did not envisage status of non-states. And we had Palestine, which was or at that stage, Palestinian Authority, which was not a state. So that was more complicated. Now there were many countries which were involved at that stage. There was Armenia, Bahrain, Cyprus, Egypt, France, Greece, Iran, Israel. Many countries uh, were involved, but the serious uh, suggestions uh, came and we had to think where to do it. So on the 15th of March, 2000, I visited uh, Amman. Uh, I met Khaled Tukan in this hotel and we had to discuss where to do this. So here is the first difficulty. I told him that in order for this to be competitive for Israeli scientists, it must be that one can reach this place by car. And he agreed with that. And we, we decided that El Balka, which was close to his heart also would be the place. However, it had to be within a reasonable time from places in Israel. So we asked his, he asked his aide to bring a map, but maps in Jordan at that time, at least, had no mention of cities in Israel. So it was difficult to find out how exactly to have the two and a half hours. In any case, we overcame also that. And it's in easy reach for Jordan, Israel, and the and the Palestine. These are the original suggestions when they made the pitch. These are the original slides when it was all a dream. On the 11th of April, 2000, we met in at CERN, again, CERN related to, to the project. And Jordan was uh, chosen as a site and a interim council we had approved Jordan. Then we had a, conce a concept design and Bessie one from Berlin was shipped to uh, Jordan. Now, one of my fields I'm studying is complexity in, in the context of black hole physics. So here is an example of complexity. Uh, 
in order to be able to do this, it turned out that uh, the director general of UNESCO came from ja with Japan from Japan with a dowry for UN from Japan to UNESCO. So he had money he can use on his own. He, together with other money, uh, discussed with scientists in Novosibirsk, which went to Berlin, disassembled, put in Lego boxes for construction, the pieces of, of uh, Bessie, put it on the ship in Hamburg, and the Lego pieces were set in, in Jordan. So now at least we had something concrete to discuss. Here is a meeting in 2003, this is almost 20 years ago, 19 years ago, where the ground was laid for sesame. These were the original ideas on what to be in sesame. These are the, again, the original slides on what the plans should be. So for architects, which have the right graphic application, it's easy to do. I think very few people believed actually it's going to happen, but gradually it was happening. This is Rafik, the Palestinian contractor who was building the place and the place got built. And here is it, the way from Israel to the place. You go through the city spal, and you go down, and there is sesame, which you saw before. 2008, the building is inaugurated. Now, there is a concept in physics, which I study, which is called holography, which is very important for black holes, but of course also in optics, which gives you, let's say, the, the, in a simplistic way, if you know what happens on the skin, you know what happens inside. So here is how sesame looked from outside, everything perfect. But this is what we had inside. Now, if holography is correct, this is enough, because from the outside, you can get all the information on the inside. Okay, but I would say it kind of tests your confidence in this idea of holography. So this needed to be filled up. And here comes the point of putting the puzzle together. Then replacing Herwig Schopper came another ex-director general of CERN, Chris Llewellyn Smith. Again, a well-known scientist, Herwig Schopper, an experimentalist, Chris Llewellyn Smith, a theorist. And here is a smooth transition uh, between the two. And actually, our current uh, president of council is Rolf Hoye, which is also uh, ex-director general of CERN. I don't think there's any other organization which has successively such high quality scientists as managing them. So as I said, unique. And this is James Gillis, which was helping with PR uh, uh, James is a guy who brought, I think, a billion people to watch uh, the discovery of the Higgs. Nobel laureates visited the place, but the place was empty. So what do you do if you have an empty place? You can fill it. You can fill it. And indeed, in May 2010, we were filling it. But what we were filling, we were filling it with, we were filling it with cement to shield from radiation. Now there was nothing that radiated, there was no machine. Okay, but you can still build the shield in case there will be a machine. So at least this gave us a way to fill the, the system. Do, try to do, uh, and here is what a Palestinian said about this, Salman Salman. Of uh, cohesiveness, uh, our actual artificial, they try to show people meeting together, kids playing together, that's not real. This is a real thing. Everybody thinks he's benefiting from it. Okay, now you can't read probably the Hebrew translation, but this is a TV person from Israel and the TV personnel in Israel are not kind. And uh, he asked him, what do you mean this is a real thing? It's empty. And then Salman, Salman, Professor Salman Salman said, yes, it's empty unless there will be the political will to do it. And indeed there was no political will enough at that stage. Then I also in physics study singularities. Here is, for example, the end of time singularity. So we reached the singularity once in Sesame. There were very few times when politics entered and we actually had a rule that politics should not be discussed. But there was one time which was rather dramatic and it was saved by Turkey. So on the 1st of June, 2010, 
a flotilla of, of Turkish uh, vessels approached Gaza Strip saying they want to break the blockade on it. I arrived that morning when this was happening because the flight from Israel to Cairo was it, I don't remember, three o'clock, landed at three o'clock in the morning. I went to sleep and when I woke up, I saw on CNN that there has been this uh, terrible loss of human life involved. And uh, when we started the meeting, uh, a certain delegate said that uh, Sesame should come out with a declaration that we, uh, Sesame, uh, condemns this. Now, I did not agree to that for several reasons. A, it was too early to judge and know what really happened. But anyhow, even if it would be clear, I, in my opinion, there were many, many bodies which can condemn and successfully condemn Israel over the years anyhow. And if we turn Sesame into one of these bodies, the community in Israel will lose sight, will lose any interest in it. So we should keep politics here outside. There are enough places where politics plays a role. Now, the person who I stood up and said, if we are discussing this, I'm leaving. I, I don't see any reason to stay here anymore. So the person who saved this was actually a Turk. He was a Turkish representative, Ulko Dinser. And as I told you, everything is personal. He was a diplomat, not a scientist. So he could have said, well, I, I'm going to call Ankara and consult. Instead, he said, I'm against us discussing politics in Sesame. And he said, he brought in examples from the early days of Britain, where he said that uh, building an academy in London was a failure because they had to discuss religion all the time. And only when they stopped discussing religion, they could make progress. So he said he's against it. And then this went away and we could continue to collaborate. So from my point of view, uh, Ulko is the person who saved uh, the project, a watershed moment. In the, mean, in the meantime, it gets filled, filled, but no money. Okay, so now, how to, what to do? So in this case, I must say, I took my an initiative. The two young men you see there are two Israelis uh, from the Ministry of Finance, which is a big enemy usually of the professors because they think we get too much, our salaries are too much. And they agreed to come. They were met by Khaled Tukan. And we had a discussion there and they got so impressed that they said that they would help that Israel gives uh, money if also Jordan, Turkey, and other countries would agree uh, to give money, five million, in order to build a new machine and let's forget the old machine. So this was a crucial moment. I think it, it helped Sesame cross the, the barrier, the hurdle. And eventually, in Egypt had the revolution which happened and then it was out of this but Iran actually came in and we had meetings where we decided that we are going each to give five million dollars in order to help buy a new machine and I'm going to show you now what I think the most irregular meeting that ever happened where representatives from Turkey, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, Iran sit and sign a document where we commit to give each five million dollars. So this is March 10th, 10 years ago in a small room in Amman, and you will see it's less than a minute allowed Sesame to, from now on to, to become a re realistic. This helped convince INFN, Professor Fernando Ferroni, or Nando, to give between three to five million euro for the project. Once he did that, this convinced Rolf Hoye to go back to the European Commission, which was not willing to give money directly to Sesame. They gave 5 million euro to CERN to build together joint teams or, or design together joint teams, what many of the components of the machine. So they go to Sesame. And here are the happy people. Here is how this is happening. You see how, how multinational, is even the magnet it has contribution from Spain, France, UK, Germany, Turkey, Pakistan, Cyprus, uh, Italy, Switzerland, and Israel. And here are the pieces. 
they are being brought to sesame, they are being assembled. This is when uh, dreams, the stuff dreams are made out of, becomes suddenly steel, concrete. And I, I was excited to touch the steel in which the dream turned into. So these are the various pieces. Finally, it's not just radiation shielding. There is a real machine there. It was inaugurated on, in 2017. This is Khaled Tukhan and myself. This is again, Edward Witten, who is the head of the Israeli Academy and uh, the, per, the, the head of the Planning and Budgeting Committee, which gave 5 million for the machine. Uh, this is, uh, if you, I hope you know him, he was a, a commissioner of uh, Carlos Moedas from Portugal, was at the time the Commission for Science of the European Union, which also came to the meeting and the machine is working. Then one trains people, lots of them. And as I showed in the beginning, this is for these people to give them the opportunity to train. Now in a course, I, I would have given a question. I showed sesame, but it had two different roofs. And uh, you could suspect that I'm doing Photoshop. But the reason was that we were tested once more in 2013, the biggest snow ever fell in Jordan on the place. Nobody removed snow from the roof and the roof collapsed. How lucky we were, there was nothing inside except the radiation shielding. So no damage was caused. And that was another test that we can overcome also that. So that's the reason why there is a green and then a gray roof. Then we come to the beam lines. This is the original idea of beam lines on day one. And then I'll show you what actually happened. Andrea Lausi is the person who is responsible now at Sesame for the scientific program. Again, of course, his own contribution, but also the contribution of Italy, which was systematically from Fubini onward in this project. There are three beam lines uh, in operation. I'm a string theorist. I will show you products here, the number of publications, and then I'll show more. But you see that there are now real publications. There is one mach machine for infrared spectroscopy and micro uh, microscopy. Then there is a machine for X-ray absorption, fine structure, and X-ray fluorescence. Then there are there is a material science beam. There's an idea for tomography. And right now, actually, the Helmholtz together with Turkey have built a very, very good machine. And this is a picture from December from last month, our visit uh, to the place where, where Andrea Lausi instructed us and showed us all these things. So again, you have the stuff you can't touch, which dreams are made out of, and they turn into proposals and they turn into publications and the publications. Here is a, a snapshot of some of the publications. So far, there are 64 publications coming from this place, which was didn't exist but in the dreams of people a while ago. And they're all on very, very interesting subjects. There is a slogan which I would like to implant. I think that in this case, the scientists and their drive broke boundaries and took the project and their countries to where no one had the right to expect. Nobody sitting in Ramallah or in Amman or in Tehran or in Cairo or in Ankara or in Jerusalem actually thought that this is going to work. I, let me say very, very few people believe that it worked. But the main thing is the scientists dragged everyone there. And once the politicians realized where they were, they did not blink, at least till now. They said, okay, this was not planned. It's somehow by some serendipity happened. Let's keep it. Let's leave it. Okay, here I come to complain because our region is a region, at least before the Ukraine war, was covered by every newspaper which respected itself. And every newspaper gave everybody exact advice what to do. The amount of preaching we got was immense. And the amount of money which we got, except eventually from the European Union, was meager. Uh, and they science, tell me. if you want to do science, high-end science, which requires money, the first thing it needs is the political will. 
Now, don't ask me more about it, but my point is that you have to have political will. So otherwise, the sum of 25 million euro is maybe less than the cost of an F-16. Okay, so this was the feeling, but as I said, the European Union stepped up and these are people like Bernard Fabian and Carlos Moedas, which actually changed together with Rolf Hoyer and Smith, the idea of the how the European Union looks. They gave more than 12 million to the project. This changes in time. We got a lot of money from the region. There's about 47 million, which for basic science in this region is an enormous amount of money. Personally, I had a lot of satisfaction having for the first time in history, Israeli scientists doing work at Sesame. And here is a group of them. As I told you, all of these very high quality people have dedicated a large time of their life for Sesame. And I, in my opinion, being director generals of CERN was a good preparation for them for the complexities of the Middle East. But to graduate, they really needed also to pass the Middle East. My dream here is that the quality of the work we do there eventually will be worthy of a Nobel Prize. What are other things I would like to add? In 2019, Sesame, not for altruistic, re I mean, for its own reasons, has become the first green accelerator. This actually saved us in the sense that we did not, we were not dependent on energy prices. So we became the first green accelerator and you see here the farm involved. Thanks to the generosity of Italy, the Sergio Fubini guest house where the scientists making experiments in Sesame can live was inaugurated. And you see here the Italian ambassador to Amman, you see two heads of the INFN, you see Antonio Zoccoli and you see Nando Ferroni who just uh, finished then his part. And we have here the Sergio Fubini guest house, which by the way is a very nice guest house. I will just say we visited the United States in asking for money. Here we are visiting the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House under Obama, here under Trump. And we are visiting Congressman Rush Holt, who even now, while we are there, he's actually looking at his iPhone, what he actually passed through the House of Congress twice $10 million uh, to help Sesame, which are crucially needed. However, when discussions with the Senate came, this twice fell through. So we are still waiting for, Europe did give a significant American monetary contribution. I cannot say the same about the US. For me, again, a, a very, very special moment occurred this in Ankara this year. Uh, Rolf Hoyer, which was president, got the evening before the, me the meeting while we were there already got confirmed that he had uh, COVID. So he asked me to conduct a meeting. So I'm here as vice president presiding over a meeting of this coalition, which you saw before, including Turkey, the Iranian Islamic Republic, Palestine, Egypt, Cyprus, not, not the usual bedfellows in this region. Now, those of you who envy and think that this was uh, a lot of tourism involved, let me tell you that the only time actually I had tourism was when we had a meeting at Petra itself. And then we could take half a day off for tourism. This is more the realism of the, of the region. Uh, we live in a very volatile region. It's not simple, it's, it's complex, and I don't want to hide that it's not there. Now, as we approach the end, we can return to this. What was this picture? I'm sure you all found out. I, uh, sorry, not yet. You don't yet get the, what is the picture? So this is, I think the major color, the dominant color of my region, it's black. There are some white spots and this the white spot in the middle is actually a Jordanian worker who is putting steel foundations on or steed rods on which one will pour the concrete to have strong foundations. So yes, 
even in, in a period when we feel that the system is over constrained, you cannot do anything to change. A group of people, as I told you, their names you don't know, did manage together somehow to make, to make a change. I want to show here what the Jordanian scientist says about this. This is Israeli TV again, a parallel universe. What is the moment you are waiting for? see the light the light we call it the light <laughs> the light at the end of the tunnel huh? and the light at the end of the tunnel so i think this is a very strong statement which is a great point to stop however i have to go a little forward because world events took us a little forward and this is related to the issue of constructing or destroying bridges now, when the Russians uh, invaded Ukraine in, in the 24th of February, this caused a very strong reaction at CERN. Many member states at CERN were very appreciated, appreciative of Sesame. However, when they were facing the same test, things became more complicated. And I was told by some ambassadors from member states, when there is war, you destroy bridges. You don't build bridges, you don't keep bridges. And this is an attitude. And here I would say that like there was Tarzan and the son of Tarzan, in a way, Sesame is the son of CERN. I have reached an age where I learned that sometimes, or maybe by now most of the time, my children actually can give me better advice than I can give myself. So maybe this is a case where actually Sesame, which came along the same ideals of CERN, can also give an advice uh, uh, to, to CERN, and this thing is yet to be seen. So it's a non-trivial thing, but in a letter which all former living, living former director generals of CERN urging CERN to keep bridges have brought up Sesame as an example in the letter they have sent to the president of council and to the director general of council. And so did several of the former presidents of CERN Council. So in a way, yes, Sesame gives the possibility of making a difference. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So for your presentation, very complex and showing all the complexity of the Middle East, as you say. So indeed, so we have, uh, so in, I'm not sure that the question and answer, unfortunately, is really working from what uh, I guess. So I have received few questions separately. So in the meantime, I invite you in the chat to write your question. And then I will read. Uh, so the question that we already have, one thing we can do as well, if you raise your hand, is I can give you the microphone and you can ask the question live. So, Professor Rabinovici. So, um, I see. So, the first question that was raised uh, during your presentation, so by uh, Lawrence Norris, so from the African Light Source as well. So, wanting to ask, uh, so what's the maximum capacity of the sesame in terms of energy and circumference for, of the storage rink and ultimate number of beam line? So it's a bit technical, but we'll come back after. Yes, and if we have Andrea, he will answer much better than me. I would say, I, I'll tell you the things I can answer. The, unfortunately, the building is 75 meters by 75 meters, and in that sense is not elastic. So uh, from the point of view of circumference, one would need to break and rebuild uh, parts. I think from the point of view of capacity, Andrea and his predecessors told me that over 20 beam lines uh, actually uh, could, could be there. Now, in terms of how, uh, unlike at CERN, you measure energy. At Fermilab in the United States, you, may, you measure intensity. So there is an energy frontier, there is an intensity frontier. Uh, here, it's much more complex. It depends on, I learned, on which experiments you are doing. So the question is not how high the energy is, but what specifics can this machine provide? And I suggest that Andrea, which knows what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, us. okay. 
Thank you, Alicia. So, uh, in, in in principle, I think that the most important thing is stability. More, even more than having more carbon, more photons, and uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, we need a, a stable machine, and uh, so the dream in this moment uh, is to go to a uh, new linear accelerator and a new booster in order to get a top up in which you can keep the current always the same, no thermal stresses on the machine and uh, a more stable beam and a more constant beam. Because what we do now is uh, it, 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 it's a model which was followed in many machines uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. It is a machine in which we inject every day. So there is an, an injection process it lasts for half an hour every morning, and then there is a decay of the beam during the day. Uh, the, the dream now is, is to go to a uh, full energy injector and have a constant current in the machine. That would be much more important than uh, raising the current in the machine. About the energy, 2.5 GV is a good compromise. Eh? It's a, in my opinion, it's the kind of machine which gives you good results with both soft x rays, hard x rays, and also IR. So it is a very flexible kind of level of energy between two, 2.5 and 3.5 gigaton volts. That is uh, where you are the, at the best flexible. And about uh, breaking the, the walls, uh, we already did once. We removed the laboratory uh, in order to, to get space for the long tomography beam line. So who knows? Maybe we can we can do something similar also for for other beam lines. Around twenty, we can we can we can do. Okay, I hope this answers our two ans two responses answer the question. Very good. So indeed, uh, uh, there was uh, uh, another question that we could uh, um, have live. Uh, so while Malik Maza so is uh, asking a question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Alieza, for this uh, comprehensive uh, contribution indeed. Uh, first of all, from the, uh, from the South African perspective and from the African continent perspective in general, I wish to express my gratitude to you and to all those who are involved in this visionary initiative. Uh, my question is that uh, you have highlighted from uh, uh, um, the, the, the situation of the synchrotron sources all over the globe. And uh, you have indeed, uh, and directly we can see that Africa, there is none of it. There is no source for the moment. And currently, uh, there are two major initiatives, one driven by uh, the African Light Source uh, Foundation, a group of uh, 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 scientists, academics, and the other one, which is the African Pan-African Synchrotron Initiative, driven by the African Academy of Science. And I can assure you, Prof and colleagues, that uh, SESAME is really considered as an outstanding role model for us, both for the AFLS as well as the, for, uh, from the African Academy of Science uh, perspective. I was just to mention, uh, 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 Prof. Eliezer, if, uh, how can I say, Israel is the first closest neighbor of the African continent. And the binding or the bridge between Africa and Israel is the Sinai. So it is just natural, I do believe, uh, uh, forgive me if, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, I uh, misspell myself. Uh, I do believe that uh, uh, African fellows uh, could also uh, uh, benefit from uh, sesame and, uh, uh, how can I say, not only from the, uh, the, um, from the humanistic aspect of it, but the quality of science and the vision of, the, of sesame. Simply said, uh, uh, Prof and colleagues, would uh, uh, African scientists be uh, welcome to use uh, uh, the facilities that, uh, of Sesame? Thank you so much. Well, I, I would answer, I think the answer is yes. 
uh, we the policy of sesame unlike by the way other light sources which because I, I will answer also Petra's uh, question how can one help but uh, so it's financially not the maybe the best business model but we are open to everybody so uh, it's only the quality of the scientific proposal which will determine uh, if one can work there or not so the answer is yes uh, I showed you there are over a hundred proposals usually coming uh, uh, each year. And as we have more beam lines, there will be more proposals and they will, are judged by a high quality scientific uh, committee. And they will, uh, if, they, if they can win, they, they will, they're welcome. Am I correct, Andrea? Yeah, sure, exactly. So uh, the, but it, we could add another idea here, maybe it's so something which I am repeating since uh, since a while now, that uh, uh, the cooperation between uh, the African Light Source uh, initiatives and uh, Sesame should go further. And uh, it, I would see quite a good chance to have an African beamline built in Sesame. Because that could that could nucleate uh, uh, even the even more the uh, the cooperation and start building the community around the future light source in Africa, which must be yeah at a certain point definitely. I totally agree, and actually in the meeting in Petra where I showed the only meeting, I can tell you that actually that meeting was in Petra only because my wife was really telling me all the time you are leaving me you are going to Jordan you are going to Jordan. So I, I said, I'm not doing any tourism. I said, okay. So I went to Khaled to Khan and I told him, please uh, solve my problem. Let's once have it at Petra so we can also see it. In that meeting, there was a representative from South Africa. I don't remember his name and I don't know uh, what happened afterwards. But in that meeting in Petra, he was there. And I think that the whole idea of be able to learn how to do such a thing by doing it at uh, Sesame, which I think is easier than doing it at ESRF, being allowed to build a beam where you learn, uh, it really can help back in the in Africa. You can be, take back the knowledge. So I think it's a very good idea, and but it has to become concrete. Mm -hmm. So I, I would support thank you. And I guess it was thank you for your supportive words. They are very important to hear these words of support because it's not an easy project to sustain for so many years. Very difficult to maintain. Very difficult. Allow me, Christine, can I come in please? For sure, for sure. I just wanted to recall it might be Simon indeed. Uh, Simon. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Elias, uh, I, I must admit, uh, it's such a, uh, and Andrea also, such a proposal will be definitely uh, be shared with the president of the African Academy of Science, uh, of course, with our FLS colleagues. Thank you so much. We will follow up on the matter. Thank you. Can I answer Petra? I see Petra posted, I see. Exactly, that would be, you were speaking about Petra in terms of the location, now maybe the real Petra can speak up. <laughs> so thank you Petra for yes, joining. Yes, hello, for those who don't know me, I'm Petra Rudolph, I'm the past president of the European Physical Society, still a vice president for another year, and I have had the great privilege of being observer in the uh, for SESAMI. And so uh, seeing that uh, there are people here, uh, and I'm a synchrotron user myself, but uh, for the people who are listening to this talk, I would like really for you, uh, Elisir, a beautiful talk, and for Andrea to tell us what can each and everyone do to help Sesame. Okay, look, I can tell you, but it will sound uh, very banal and blunt. We need money. We we work on a shoestring budget. I think if it wouldn't be the cap cap outstanding capability of improvisation that, that the Sesame staff is showing, this, this wouldn't happen uh, anyhow. We are really working. We did succeed to cross the threshold, but we are very near the threshold all the time. Uh, it's 
the, from the point of view of basic science in the region, large sums of money are an issue which are debated all the time. It's very difficult uh, to get it. So fellowships are very helpful, but really what we need is money to be able to build in injectors, to be able to, be to stabilize the beam as uh, Andrea said, I didn't discuss here the Achilles heel of, uh, of this, which actually is a German contribution because the German contribution, if it, if it suddenly stops, I don't know exactly what is going to happen. There is one piece, I didn't mention that, there is one piece of metal that is being used and that is the only thing actually used from the German contribution. The rest is still in boxes there. Now, the pieces of metal are great. And CERN uses the SPS for 60 years. It's part of the LHC. It, it, it's no problem. It's great. But here, there are no replacement parts. I don't know what is going to happen if this sink is going uh, to collapse. So we really, if you ask me, what we need money. And the money is not tens of millions, but it's millions. If if we are if it is if we are able to get from members, let's say Italy contributed such a, a significant amount, as I said, almost five, five million, I think four point something million up to now. It, it, the European Union gave 12 million euro. If the if money of this order comes, this can stabilize and help and help a lot because we are all the time on a very fragile situation. And Andrea knows more than me, but when I go there and speak with the workers and see the look in their eyes, I understand the situation is fragile. It's, it's a great achievement. I would have personally have accept, expected because so much money is poured into this region. I would have, once we have something positive and good, why not help us also with, with a little more generosity. And uh, f for me, th this, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm disappointed. That's why I showed the preacher who, who, who tells us exactly everything what to do. But when we, we come and we say, we say we do something good, ah, yeah, but you didn't do that yet. And you didn't do that. And you didn't do that. Uh, we, we, so to answer you, it's very good to get support. It's also important because it's not easy to continue. But it's also important to get just get money. And so meaning cash to be able to pay people. This is what you mean, to pay workers, to pay well, for... You need to pay the staff to, to, to have stabilized beams. You need people to work there. And but, uh, we're under, this is understaffed. And as I said, we are working on a shoestring budget. These are the facts. So under staff, so it means indeed to have collaboration potentially with other institutes like you have partially, but it can be as well on form of in-kind model or can it be possible? This model can be a bit heavy. We know this at DSS, but that could be potentially something also to develop. Is it any thought on that? Look, I don't think we insist on building equipment on our own. If if we get an, a piece of equipment, so the money is paid to workers in the country which which build it, that's fine with us. But we need the piece of equipment. That's one, and we need we need money in order to be able to have staff, beamline scientists, people in the beamlines to assist to keep the beamlines. Now, if people would want to come, let's say, and do a five-year work at Sesame when they are paid salary from their institute, okay, and help in the process, uh, building more uh, know-how in the region, it would be very helpful, but we also need to be eventually have the salaries to pay the people which, once they have the know-how and not let them see afterwards go to Sweden or to other places in the world after they have been actually trained by very good people at Sesame. So the, we have we have brain drain, and we have it because we actually train people well, and and we don't pay them well. Yeah, so but we try to initiate as well with Germany, for instance, with Professor Galeb Natur from Palestine. Uh, he is uh, uh, in uh, Ulysses, uh, so the the institute as well. Possibility there, they have trained some students, and we were hoping that there would be then some of the students then coming as well to the Sesame to help. So I don't know, Andrea, if you had some follow-up on that as well. So I think- well, it's I, 
I was in I was in Jülich on Monday, uh, speaking with Caleb, Thank and uh, we are going to uh, to to host them at uh, at Sesame for a uh, for a first meeting uh, uh, Sesame German uh, Palestine German Times Bridge on the fifth uh, and sixth of May, twenty twenty three. And uh, they will be also among the very first users of the Hazer beamline. And uh, so and then we try to go together. I don't have the possibility in this moment to hire any of them. And this is a real pity. Yeah, you have these young, fantastic students going to Uli, learning, getting a PhD, and then the, the final step is not possible because they cannot return to the, to the region. Well, the, the dream of Galeb is also to have a laboratory in Palestine, which is not materialized yet. So we are this, the closest object to having a laboratory in Palestine. And so if we could have a bit more money, and again, it's, as Elisa said, not, mil not tens of millions, millions, that would be enough to avoid ending like those who try to jump a canyon with in two jumps, which never works well. Well, they can have a parachute, a self-propelled parachute, then it would work. <laughs> but... So you may need for that as well some uh, more politics student or student who learned, for instance, like uh, we have a question from uh, Katriona uh, Harrison, who is uh, in Cambridge uh, University as well, studying politics. And she's very interested as well in the region. And she's staying now in Hama. And she was asking, uh, so if there are any agreement in place to allow easy travel for scientists using uh, the SESAMI, so regardless of the nationality. Yes, so the, one of the... It's a condition to become a to become the site. You, it's one of the conditions that you. So, Jordan actually has been very successful in that because uh, they have brought in. We as you saw the names of the countries involved. It's not easy, and Jordan was o always open to all. I think there were only exceptional cases when people were on on some blacklist of the UN, or it, it needs to be a very extreme case. Uh, in order not uh, not to be able to happen. So the answer to her is yes, they can come and uh, everybody's committed to that. So Palestinians can come from the West Bank or from wherever the, they come and the same goes uh, for Iranians which come and the same goes for anybody. So the, Jordan is open, has promised and kept its promise. It's, I, I am not familiar again, except one case where it was on a blacklist. I, I'm not uh, familiar of any case where there was a complaint that people were not allowed to come. Okay, and this is a bit of the, the concept as well for building the sesame to allow everyone as well. So we have uh, maybe a, a tricky question, so I may ask it as well. So on behalf of uh, uh, Daniel Sonalma, who is asking about uh, the tricky collaboration uh, with Dubna, so in uh, in Russia. So, how does it sound? Uh, can you say a few words on that? Well, uh, I don't. I would say that a uh, also CERN collaborates uh, with JINR, but I I I, I would like it's more. Com we have uh, international collaboration agreement with JINR in. Unfortunately, the Russian Federation showed interest long ago in Sesame, but at a certain moment they decoupled. So the issue didn't come up. We, we don't have collaborations with JINR, and that's it. So there was nothing, there was no change or no, in the situation because there was nothing there. I think Russia Federation is still officially an observer, but for many, many years they, they did not attend any meeting. So the, the issue is uh, null, null, doesn't exist. So does it answer your question? So Daniel, so I left you the possibility to speak. Uh, more or less, uh, yes. I, I had uh, uh, a visit recently of a scientist who is uh, on Dubna, uh, from the vice director, deputy director, 
He has a daughter in Israel, so he came to Israel to visit. And uh, there are terrible problems, if only also for uh, for the corporate, for um, financial uh, reason, because uh, all everything is is blocked, and even trans transportation from Russia, you can travel to Istanbul to to Turkey, you can travel to Israel, but that's about it. So okay. it's, it's, this is a question now not related to sesame, right? As I no, said, well, it's yes, but it's, it's an impact on, on sesame. Well, and I said, unfortunately, we do, we'd never had the really relations with JNR for many years. Mm. So mm. it has no impact. Okay, so we have another question from Petha. Yes. Um, something that I discussed with uh, Andrea and that maybe not everybody knows is that uh, in Europe uh, we have a concept of uh, double degree PhDs, which means that you do a PhD with two institutions. And so uh, one can think of uh, coming back to the question of uh, African scientists, if there is somebody who would like to do a double degree PhD between an African university and a European university, where the European university pays half of the PhD and the African university pays half of the PhD, that can very well happen at Sesame. Uh, if it involves uh, synchrotron radiation, of course. So this is one possibility in which people can use Sesame, do experiments there, and at the same time also have the collaboration with the university in Europe where there are people like me, I don't want to be presumptuous, but we have a certain degree of experience in synchrotron experiments where other people can have a, a, an advantage from so this kind of possibilities exist and there is money for it so people should take advantage of it yeah, uh, I wish uh, 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 can I come in please please yeah thank you thank you so much uh, prof I was just to uh, mention that this is a fantastic opportunity that you are offering and you are proposing uh, at least from my side, uh, being the, the chairholder of the UNESCO UNISA Africa Chair in Nanosciences and Nanotechnology, and a user of the Synchrotron, the ESRF in particular, and Soleil, we are absolutely, I am absolutely ready from yesterday to embark with you and SESAME within the SESAME framework uh, uh, in this endeavor. From yesterday, madam. Thank you. I wish to have your contact details, ma'am. Thanks. Just so Google me, you find them right away. I will use this opportunity to say hi to Zara, which is very <laughs> silent, which usually is not the case. She usually tells her opinion uh, straight. Indeed, but, uh, can we have maybe some of the last word by Zara? This is what I wanted to, to give you the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much to have joined. Rolf Hoyer was also with us, by the way, he had to leave a bit earlier, unfortunately, but he gave the best greeting. So yeah, Zara, please. Uh, give well, I have to say, I was so impressed by your talk that I thought there was nothing to add. And also I learned so much from it that, um, uh, it was really very motivating and very inspiring for me to hear the whole story also from your uh, perspective, uh, Eliezer. Thank you very much indeed. This was a very good way of putting the whole thing together. And also, I must say, um, again, I'm a little bit speechless about the bridge you showed at the end. Now the bridge which is broken. Um, I would I would like to see that bridge being mended. I would like to see that bridge being operational again, you know, and I think Sesame is an important a stone in in this kind of communication. So we have to, uh, guard it, we have to protect it, we have to put in all possible 
um, effort to keep it going. And I was going to ask you um, what, what, what you consider as the most important factor in the sustainability of Sesame. I mean, it's certainly money, um, certainly usage, that people keep on using it, people keep on putting projects, proposals, and also that the young people uh, come to Sesame and young people participate, contribute to Sesame. I think this is very important. And I think we really all have to do the best we can to, to uh, find ways of keeping Sesame going, regardless of what happens around, regardless of what happens in the microcosmos and macrocosmos um, around us. This is a very precious um, being to my mind. Sesame is a being, a very precious being. And we have to pay all our uh, efforts. We have to uh, focus all our efforts to keep it going. I think this is very important. And thanks to APS also to for giving uh, such a wide exposure to Sesame and such a, a platform so that people, different people from Sesame can um, uh, voice their opinions. Uh, I think this is very important. And collaboration with African Light Source, for example, will be an excellent, again, another piece for this bridge to, uh, to be built further because this will make things more visible, more viable, more sustainable, I think, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah, because indeed uh, the, the work and the effort from the APS and the American side as well can be uh, improved, certainly, like uh, always, but uh, I think that there is a lot of effort that has been committed so far. We will have the annual leader meeting next week, uh, and I will not forget to mention all of those efforts. I know that Amy um, so was there as well, so with you, uh, and certainly had much more idea. We can certainly try to find a way to emphasize more the Sesame. So Elise will be presenting at the March meeting, so the APS March meeting. And we have as well Rolf Foyer who will give a presentation in the April um, APS meeting. So I think the visibility and possibility to find those interface with maybe American, more American university, to have more youngsters as well, because with that is the key, I agree with that. And maybe we should add, uh, Andrea could, say something about this, even if it's a small, tiny little piece, there is a request from an American uh, university student to do an internship at Sesame and get this uh, put into her credentials that she will be doing an internship at Sesame. So this is, this is something I think worth mentioning that um, the word of mouth gets everywhere and people are finding out. This is a student who's doing chemistry and she's also interested in archeology, span I think, or, or um, antique history. So she thought when she heard about Sesame, she thought this would be an excellent place to do, a, to do an internship. I would add there, uh, well, thanks for the kind words, but I don't think that you need me for inspiration because you have been a source of inspiration. Uh, yourself over the years. And without you, I don't see how things in Turkey would have moved. And Turkey is now a very strong supporter of Sesame. So that's, uh, I would say from the American point of view, if there is any way that the HALT initiative can be helped by the American Physical Society, because he succeeded twice to pass through Congress, House of Representatives, a bill for 10 million, but then it got stuck with negotiations with the Senate. Now the Senate is, now the House has become Republican, but the Senate is Democratic. Actually, I must say, uh, and please erase it from the recording, that when we visited OSTP, I found more in the Trump period, we found more going towards us than 
in the Obama period. Contrary to what you would have expected by just reading newspapers. So. Yeah, they can be latent as well. They can be a lot of factors, of course. But yes, this is true. So we will speak to congressman as well. And I think, I think uh, to encourage Hall to, to continue this and maybe maybe now he's in a less influential position because they lost the house. The house has now become Republican. But I think that would be a game changer. If the United States would put in the 10, 12 million to, for the various components, it would be, again, a big step forward for Sesame. And, uh, and, and there, the, a lot of the thing would be like what Petra asked. I mean, it, it can be in kind. I mean, things can be built in Argon. They don't have to be built at Sesame. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not, that's not the important thing. I mean, it's important and great, but the most important thing is to be able to ex use the beam lines. So, okay. Yeah, like we will we will pass message and uh, also indeed looking at inspiration for the case of Ukraine maybe maybe if you can say just few words as well on that. So Ukraine, indeed, well, Ukraine the problem is not resolved. We will uh, CERN Council. I can tell you what the CERN Council's decision were. In March, we decided to suspend the observer status of the Russian Federation and of JNR. Uh, th this is a political. A step, but it, it doesn't have scientific uh, consequences unless the side who is suspended decides to say that if I'm suspended, I'm not interested in, 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 okay. But this did not happen for the time being. Now we did decide, however, later in June that uh, we have the, that unless really there's going to be a big change, uh, there will be a termination of the international collaboration agreements with the Russian Federation, and we will re-examine JNR. JNR, we did not declare, declare the intent to terminate the, because it's an international organization, even though it's 80% held by, by the Russian Federation. Uh, from the point of view of uh, Russian Federation and Belarus, the decision of council was uh, to terminate the international collaboration agreement, I'll explain the the, the juristic difference. Uh, if we would, the action that originally was requested by some member states was uh, that we unilaterally break the agreement. Now, uh, the agreement in there are a list of provisions which allow you to unilaterally uh, stop the international collaboration agreements and. A war, a, a war or a special operation uh, declared by one country against an, another country, an observer, let's say on an associate member, which is the case here, is not one of the provisions. So the, the, the argument became more complex uh, and actually Dutch uh, lawyers were consulted on this, but it becomes much more uh, complex. Now, on the other hand, the international collaboration agreements need to be renewed and they don't have to be renewed. So if you don't renew them, you're not breaking any agreement unilaterally. You're just saying we don't want to renew it anymore. On the other hand, let's say the decisions we took on the observer status suspension are, are, are legitimate in the sense that the, the council grants the observer status and the council can take it. It's not part of an agreement. It's, it's a decision that we offer you an observer and then we can take it away unilaterally. This is not bound by a bilateral agreement, but the international collaboration agreements are by. Are by. So as I said, there is no simple uh, proviso which allows you to break it anyhow, even if you, if you want it or did not want it. Of course, it's very sad because CERN is an expert in building bridges and is not an expert in uh, demolition. I mean, this is, this are other organizations which are specialists, but certain expertise is not there. So it's, it's all this whole process is very painful. Yeah, very painful indeed, as you say. So we really hope that there will be some way to resolve this conflict in the soon future so that science can be indeed without frontier. 
in that world. So with those last words, because we uh, really have now to finish, uh, so sorry, we've been really long, but I think it was so exciting. So with all your description and all the different questions. So we have, uh, so Lawrence as well, Lawrence Maurice has put in the chat, uh, so quite some uh, information for the American side. So we'll come back on that, Lawrence. I think it's good, maybe on another platform and potentially next week could be a good opportunity. I watched the span long ago when he passed it, but is there new is there new information from what year is the span? If uh, maybe uh, Lawrence Norris can tell us from where is this? Uh, was it when he succeeded to pass it through Congress? First attempt, second attempt, or is this something new? So Lawrence, you can speak. Uh... Yes, it's new. So um, in the uh, omnibus bill that was just uh, passed by Congress um, and signed into law by President Biden was this reporting language uh, that I put into the chat. Uh, so reporting language doesn't have the force of law, but the wise agency head reads it and follows it assiduously um, because it, it marks the intent of Congress. Uh, and, and agency heads, always need to be in line with the intent of Congress. This is the intent of the old Congress or is no, this is this is the intent of the of right the old Congress that just adjourned at the end of 2022. Yeah. So the, the the funding for the US government for FY23, the year that we are in, um, was passed in the final days of December right. of uh, 2022. And uh, the appropriations bill included um, deep, deep down in the bowels of the of the language what I put into the chat. I just um, see, but long story short, it means, and then I, I see a link, which is a link. Get... So you can see Representative Foster um, talking to, uh, to Congress uh, about that language from FY21. Uh, it's yeah. so what he did with FY22 is basically the uh, a, a new attempt at what he tried to do in FY21. It's okay. um, so in FY21 he was not successful for um, really a technical reason, but he was able to pull it off for FY23. Um, and uh, um, now it's up. We, now it's the I've been in touch with Andrea. We, just, uh, we have to figure out okay, what does all this mean, and sort through all the paperwork, and basically move from an appropriation which Congress and the president have provided for to um, an obligation to use U.S. government speak. Um, and that that might take I don't know how long, um, but the. Um, we probably have to come back at another time, another forum to sort through all of that. And Sesame Management has to uh, do a lot of that. And so that's, that's very probably important. expended, you know, my abilities to really even peer into this thing. C can you please send this by email because the chat will disappear once we stop. If you could send this link by email, to, uh, either directly to me or through Christine, and she would send it to me. So. I could uh, also bring it here because this has relevance also in Israel, the fact that the Americans took a certain position. Uh, sure, and I, Andrea has it all. I think Walt has it all. Um, um, so. I, yeah, I, I had spoken with, of, of this with Rolf a couple of days ago. And uh, uh, so now I, I, can, I can forward also to you, Elisa. Yes, the, please do. The message. Yeah. Yep. I, I thought it. Rolf was going to do it, but okay, I do it privately. No problem. From Rolf, I learn I hear only bad news. Good news, he will not pass. Okay. <laughs> he, he could, uh, but unfortunately, there was uh, a lot of different flavor as well to bring there. So, indeed, it's the multidisciplinarity uh, that we need there. So, it was good that we can find as well with this platform possibility to combine and connect as well, finding so solution. So uh, we really have unfortunately to leave, but then indeed this is potential some new as well discussion for later on. And there's gonna be some homework as well for you, Elise, when you will come as well in March. So 
so for the APS. I, so. I will ask, I will now write a letter to Rolf that if he can be more explicit of what okay. is going on. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I, you see, I, it's always good to give a lecture because you learn from the, you learn from the audience more than you give. So, great. And, and he you. was sorry. He was sorry to have to leave too early again. Huh? So he, he will uh, so follow up later on. Uh, and then, so indeed, we need to to close. Unfortunately, so that was uh, another very very nice possibility to know more about the sesame. So complementary to what was said with uh, the different view, and as you said, indeed to have um, so indeed with the German and with all the uh, different contribution, with hardware, with need for cash, and having possibility for action. Student being really the one that will change and, and tune as well the future, the multidisciplinarity as well. I think it's important, scientists, engineers, but as well, some economists and certainly some politicians and some lawyers will certainly help in that, uh, in that venue. So a lot to do, but uh, this is uh, why I think it's so exciting. And this is why we always see a light. And this example, this symbol that you gave in that picture, I think is the perfect way as well to keep the hope. So thank you a lot, Elise. And I will uh, so just you. share my screen. Thank you for organizing this and the APS. Thank you very much. And thanks thank for the patient audience who survived the two hour talk. Yeah, it, it was long. Not to be taken for granted. So exactly. And this is why everything is recorded and everything can be seen at the pass of uh, uh, the long uh, night in the winter <laughs> where we can learn more. So I share now so the um, just the slide showing the next uh, presentation that we will have. So this is going to be so on the 24th of February. So we will uh, then uh, transcend as well more boundaries by having uh, so the um, uh, so this is the funding president of uh, the American um, so engineer without uh, frontier, engineer without borders, sorry, and uh, the co-founder as well of engineer without uh, borders uh, international. So Bernard Amadi, who will present uh, uh, how to navigate uh, the complexity around across also some more peace sustainability, climate security. So it means it's more towards environment. So not uh, only uh, geopolitical, but I think it can have. Uh, a lot of connection because he has been a lot also involved with uh, the Middle East. So combining uh, all those uh, different uh, so connection between countries. So we're really happy that uh, the Forum of International Physics can contribute for that and, and as well to have for the SESAMI the possibility to, to give a little bit more photon so that we can make some, uh, some more experiments uh, operating and developing new innovation for the life of uh, the humanity of tomorrow, let's say. <laughs> so thank you very much. And we will uh, close then now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very bye -bye. much. Also. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.